Hey, sorry for the interruption, but we wanted to let you know that this week's episode is brought to you by Spotify for Podcasters. Really cool app. Josiah and I use it for every single show that we bring to you every week. You can edit podcasts right from your phone or computer so you can start creating as soon as you log into the platform. You can easily distribute your podcasts to Spotify and everywhere else the podcasts are heard, just like we do every single week. You can also create video podcasts on Spotify, which is really cool. And of course, you can earn money like I'm doing right now by including ads and even podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free. There's no catch. We really love it. We use it every single week. So we encourage you to go download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. All right, let's get back to the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Print On Demand cast. Each week, join Travis and Josiah as they provide insight into the print-on-demand industry and equip you with the tools, advice, and strategy you need to achieve success and hopefully have a few laughs along the way. Now, on to this week's show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Print On Demand cast, the premiere of season two. We don't make you wait like Netflix. (laughs) We don't make you wait a year for the next season two. And I only say that because I am... Just a touch salty that I binge watched the third season of Cobra Kai in four days, and I have to wait another year or however long for <laughs> season four to resolve what is happening. Anyway, we don't do that here on Print on Demand Cast. We go right into season two the next week, and that's what we're doing this week. Travis, welcome to season two of the Print on Demand Cast. Does it feel any different? Do we feel older, wiser? What do we feel? It's 2021. How are you feeling? Um. I'm I'm feeling like 2020 is in the rearview mirror, and I'm pretty happy about that. I will say, I've, there you go. Yeah, the bell. It's the bell. That's right. It's worthy of a bell. <laughs> it I is. I've not watched Cobra Kai season three yet, so no spoilers. I'm only season right, only right, up to season right. two. I'm I'm kind of you know pacing myself. Well, um, you're I'm, better I'm for not, it. You're better for it. I have no <laughs> self control, and I binged it in four days, and I realized that it's my own fault that I have uh, that I watched them so fast, and I'm just here waiting in anticipation if i could pace myself i would but i can't when it comes to that stuff so i'm I'm one of those people that like has like you know 17 shows that i'm slowly watching over time and i'm always <laughs> still looking for a new show yeah you know yep. i don't i don't want anything to ever end so i'm always sure. like trying to just milk it as long as i possibly can yeah no i agree i we have uh my wife and i are watching the crown now which is really good um mm. it's about the royal family in in london but i'm the same way i'm always looking for a new show but inevitably i end up watching friends office or new girl in perpetuity <laughs> and then occasionally branching out to watch something else but always returning back to those that have loved me the best and that is the office friends and new girl so but the office is off netflix now uh which is another tragedy mm. so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time i'm sure maybe Anyway, so listen, season two is up and running now for Front Demand Cast. And today, uh, this episode, to kick things off, we have a friend of yours, a friend of, I know her, you know her better than I do, you've known her for longer, uh, but I have met her and gotten to hang out with her at a conference that, here's, here's a tidbit of information the listeners may not know. Travis used to put on a annual sellers conference, an Amazon sellers conference called RMRC, Rocky Mountain Reseller Convention. Re- RMRC, right? Conference. Conference. Rocky Mountain Reseller Conference. Conference, yep. yes. Every year, and it was it was a good time. Had lots of fun uh, here in Denver. So, Travis, uh, tell us a little bit about who we're going to be talking with. Tell us about Robin and uh, how you met her, and then we'll kind of get into the, the meat of the interview. Sure. I, I met Robin, I don't know, probably five or six years ago um, doing Amazon just at different conferences. I'd always see her around. She had a podcast. She had a blog. Mm-hmm. Um, she She's a book, doing right? A few as things. well? Yeah, she had a she had a book too. Mm-hmm. Yep. She was doing a little bit of stuff here and there. And, and I actually had her speak a few times at, at RMRC. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's amazing communicator. She's just such a wealth of knowledge. In fact, yeah. and I'll allude to this, um, you know, on the Uh, when we actually do the interview, but I hired her um, a while back to help me with some Mm -hmm. of the stuff in my business just as a consultant. And man, I, it was like drinking from a fire hose with her. (laughs) She really just uh, was giving me all kinds of information and all kinds of things to consider. It really helped 
um, yeah. helped me ultimately become or like get to where I'm at now. So I owe her a lot. And, um, you'll, you'll see as we, when we do the interview, um, she's, she's kind of like a sister to me and I really appreciate her yeah. and, um, have a lot of respect for her. So I'm really excited to, uh, to get into that interview. Yeah, absolutely. And like Travis said, uh, there is such a, a wealth, a wellspring of knowledge that, that we cover that Robin has, and we cover a lot of ground, uh, in this yeah. interview. So because of that, uh, we are going to kind of forego the point of interest this week. So you won't hear any fancy, uh, sound bites or, or bumpers this week, but they'll be back. I know that's why everyone listens to the show is to see what in the world <laughs> we do this week with the bumpers. Uh, but we're going to forego that because there's so much information in the the interview itself. And so, uh, yeah. the, again, if you couldn't tell by now, uh, the interview with Robin Johnson is our main event of the podcast. Main event? Who's calling? Well, Travis, this week, the the first episode of, of 2020, we have uh, a guest, an interview to do for the kickoff of season two, which is awesome. I'm super excited about it because you and I both know this person. You know her more than I do, but I'm super excited to get her insight and to get her knowledge into what it means to kind of build and plan your business. So uh, we want to welcome Robin Johnson to the show. Robin, thank you so much for taking time to join the two of us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I love getting to share and uh, what we've learned like over like I was thinking about it, it's been over a decade now. I'm selling online and uh, it's been a fun, crazy road, but I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to get to share what I've learned over that those years. Yeah, Robin, we're really excited to to hear from you as well. Um, we've known each other for probably five or six years now. Um, you know, we kind of initially or, you know, got to know each other through the Facebook world and then, uh, through Amazon and a lot of mutual acquaintances and then ended up getting to share, share a lot of, a lot of time together at different conferences. And I even hired you, uh, to help me in my business a few years ago. I'll share a little bit about that, um, in a little while, but I I'd love for you to start by telling our listeners, you know, kind of your history in e-commerce and, and then why people should listen to you, because our, our audience is mainly, you know, print on demand people. And I don't I mean, I know you have some experience with the permit print on demand industry, you know, you know, people who are who are in it. Um, but your knowledge is, is a little more broad. So I, I just want to speak to that you know, right off the bat. Why should people that are doing print on demand listen to you if you're not actually actively doing print on demand day day in, day out? So I'll, I'll start with kind of a little bit about my history and what wow, we're doing now. And, you know, I want to be, you know, a lot of people who are successful uh, online and they have a course or something along that, you know, they're like, oh, when I was a kid, I had so much hustle. I did a lemonade stand and I sold all these <laughs> things. I hated selling anything. Like I, I was in like the least capitalistic position you can have. I was a youth pastor. So, you know, you, you know, you just, he, but my son, he was, he was he got sick, and there was a point where they were testing him for like Job's disease, like Job from the Bible, because they couldn't figure out mm -hmm. there's a disease that's named after that. And the test was going to be like three thousand dollars or something. And my first thought as a mom wasn't like, yes, let's go do it. It was, how do I keep my kid alive and not lose the mm -hmm. house? And um, so we were wow. doing like the Dave Ramsey thing, and I, I couldn't even afford the Dave Ramsey like hundred dollar Financial Peace University. My friend uh, paid for it because um, mm -hmm. we just we didn't have any extra money, and. Uh, about CD6, uh, he talks about extra income, and there was a story about this woman that was like buying, selling strollers uh, on Craigslist. And I was like, I could do that. And I took five twenties mm -hmm. out of my emergency fund, and we started uh, from you know just buying things on uh, in garage sales and selling on Craigslist. I started to move quite a bit on eBay. Uh, you know, at the peak, we were doing about forty thousand dollars a month on eBay. Uh, we moved to Amazon. Um, we were selling. Quite in just about in just under three to four years, we built a seven-figure business from that hundred dollars. We didn't have wow. access to twenty thousand dollars in credit cards because our credit was bad because we had no money for so long. <laughs> 
uh, you know, and um, so we started buying things, reselling them. Uh, we started doing, doing wholesaling. Uh, as we started to grow, we started also coach six, seven, and eight-figure sellers, helping them be more profitable, um, helping them to kind of watch their margins, understand business a little bit better. Um, and that, you know, working not only with my own business as it grew, but also working with, you know, hundreds of other people's businesses as their business grew, really gave me a a deep perspective into lots of different kinds of niches within e-commerce. And there always are some things that are very specialized, but there are some things that are very general and things that I, f I find that no matter where people are, that these can be hangups. Um, and then in the last four or five years, we've kind of been transitioning from reselling ourselves to working as an agency. So now we have a digital marketing agency that specializes in Amazon. Uh, but we've been eating, sleeping, breathing, Amazon specifically for over a decade, um, but we've been working with all sorts of different e-commerce businesses. So everything from, you know, the scrappy seller that you know that you look up to might have hired us uh, to, you know, the brands that you see in Whole Foods and Home Depot and Lowe's and Ace Hardware, those brands are come to us for advice too. Hmm. So I'm, you know, it's been really, really fun and I've, I've had a chance to do some really things that I never would have thought. I got to speak at Harvard for Women's Entrepreneurship Day. Wow, uh, I wow. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. I spoke with Ty Lopez, like not the same the <laughs> same thing he spoke there too. I was like, that's so weird. Um, but uh, and then I I write for Search Engine Journal. And then if you're outside of the Amazon space, you probably know SEM Rush. Um, I have a course that's coming out with them on their academy probably in the next year. Wow, that's. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all of that has really kind of materialized um, in the last few years, even though you've been in e-commerce for over 10. Um, what do yeah. you what do you attribute all that? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm using air quotes success, yeah. uh, you know, because I mean, uh, what do you contribute all that? To? Just 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 kind of the day in day out um, being in the trenches and just um, and then just networking. You know, networking is important. You know, being in there and actually doing it uh, and not getting so caught up in coaching that we stop selling ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. there, it can be really easy that, you know, sometimes people will start to teach and then they don't do. And then especially in e-commerce, right. things change so quickly um, You know, because I'm speaking at a lot of the conferences where, you know, some of the best Google uh, uh, paid advertisers, uh, you know, agencies yeah. will run. And also, you know, like I'm, I'm getting different perspectives um, and then also just watching the future. Um, one of the things like as I've you know, I've been around for a while, uh, you know, about I, I always have like a wave of friends who are like, whatever they're in right now, what have they been doing is, oh, this is dead. It's dying. This is, this is the worst thing ever. You know, we're not, nobody's making any money. But then I see a whole new generation coming in doing kind of on that same platform that is doing really, really well. So one of the things that has been really important to us is we're always looking towards the future and trying to stay away from the curve. I kind of always kind of imagine myself as like Indiana Jones running away from that big ball, <laughs> uh, you know, especially on anything e-commerce, you have to be focused. You know, Google changes, uh, like, like if you're on the Google side, Google made some massive changes last year that totally disrupted everything. Uh, and then Amazon, well, Amazon always makes things, changes things. So, <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think that it's, at the, you know, but it's, it's consistent hard work and then learning. I think the biggest thing where you, you can get must get caught up is not looking towards the future and also not making sure that you're, you don't have to have it all at once, but you need to start building out those business fundamentals so that as you start to get bigger deals put in front of you, you can better assess those deals. Sure. Hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that's a perfect segue into, um, why I hired you, Robin. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was probably, I don't know, three or four years ago. It was really, Kind of before I'd really jumped full on into print on demand, I was still selling on Amazon and and Etsy and eBay and um, trying to do a lot of retail arbitrage. And I had some, you know, employees, and I kept wondering why the heck I wasn't ever making you know as much money as I was when it was just me. I was trying to trying to get bigger, but yet my bank account was getting smaller. And um, and so I called, you know, I called Robin and. Um, had her come out and kind of sit with me at our kitchen table or dining room table for about three days. And we really went into um, kind of the minutia of business. And I learned so much during that time that I'm still 
you know, um, I'm still utilizing in my business. And I'm, I mean, it was one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here, Robin, is to share some of, some of those really cool insights that I learned. Um, and, and, you know, they were probably just business basics, but I had never really had anybody share, share with me some of those, those basics. And so, um, it was, it was really impactful in my business. I ended up, um, letting a guy go because I just couldn't, frank, frankly, I couldn't afford him. So hopefully no one gets fired today from your presence. <laughs> <laughs> the severance but, uh, package will Josiah, come from Robin you... Johnson. Should someone get fired from her advice today? <laughs> uh oh. I don't know. So I guess um, you may want to turn off the uh, the <laughs> report or the machine right now, whatever you're listening to. Um, yeah. You know, buyer beware. <laughs> yeah, look at the show notes. We'll let you know. We'll let you know what happens. <laughs> so, Robin, as, as Travis said, um, a lot of people that are listening to our show, of course, are in the print-on-demand business, and whether it's drop shipping or they're producing themselves. So, you know, if Travis were to have come to you when he was getting into the print-on-demand business and and setting it up from scratch, what are some of the things that someone setting up a, a pod business would, would want to focus on? We'll start there. What, what do you think are some of the essential things that you need to keep in mind when building this business model? So you, you need to understand a little bit about psychographics and demographics. You have to be able to understand your customer and utter, in order to understand what's going to cause them to purchase. So if you're going, you know, I had a, 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 a a national team. They came to me and they wanted to do some products for Amazon. And they're like, you know, we're just going to do a jersey. And I was like, well, you can't just do a jersey. Who's your target audience? Are you trying to target the people in the box seats? Are you trying to, you know, target the people in the cheap sheets, cheap seats? Uh, Because, you know, the type of fabric you use, the type of jersey you use, the price point, all of those things, you know, an inexpensive jersey is going to turn off people in the platinum seating areas, right? So you need to understand your customer. uh, And then you need to understand all of your costs. So, it's really easy to look at. I sell this for nine ninety five, and then let's say I'm selling on a marketplace, and I take this much fees, or you know I'm spending this much on ads, and that's taking that much fees, or this is how much it costs me to print. You need to make sure you're really looking at all of your costs to understand your margins, um, because in general, you know your margins are going to shrink as you grow, um, because you're going to have to, you know you're probably calculating your time is free. So as soon as you have to hire somebody, that's going to make a substantial sure. dip into your margins. And the other yep. thing is, you know, you really need to account for, like if I was going to hire somebody to design these images, and let's say I'm a grid designer, um, and so I'm going to design these images for free, but at some point I'm going to have somebody else do that. You need to be building that amount into your costs, right? So to hire a designer at the same level of me would cost X per hour. They could do probably X many any X designs per hour, uh, so mm-hmm. this is going to tell me that, you know, for each one of these design shirts that I'm testing, um, this is how much that cost is. And then you want to start to look at of of how many shirts do we design before we get a hit. So you can understand and, you know, they, OK, with, with the research that we're doing, we get about one winner out of how many shirts, you know, whether it's yeah. nine out of 10 or it's one out of 10 or one out of 25, um, then that's something you want to be thinking about as well to make sure that you have enough capital on hand. Mm. Uh, you know, and one of the big differences between print on demand and uh, let's say you creating the inventory and holding yourself. So let's say somebody's going to actually run a, like a traditional manufacturing piece. Mm-hmm. You really need to think about the cost of carrying multiple SKUs and multiple sizes and multiple colors is really, really mm-hmm. cash intensive. Yeah. So, you know, especially if you're trying to make that transition or if you're like, oh, I'll just bump, I'll move one way or the other. There's just, there, one's not inherently better than the other. It's just that they have different concerns. And so yeah. if you're holding that inventory, you need to think about cash flow significantly and how you're going to move those slower moving items. And that also means you're going to have to get really into the data, really understanding what sells. You're going to be able to throw less mud against the wall. You're going to have to be a little bit more scientific. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas if, you know, if, you're, if you're doing print on demand, you have a little more flexibility to try a lot of different things, but you have to make sure that you don't get so distracted in trying a lot of things that you don't actually start to distill what is really working for you. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love what you said at the beginning there, um, you know, talking about taking all of your individual costs into, um, into account, because I, I mean, we, 
you know, we're on Facebook in the Amazon communities and the, you know, or e-commerce communities, you always hear people talking about the revenue, you know, and, oh, I made a hundred and they say, I made a hundred thousand dollars this month. Yeah. And what they mean is that I had a hundred thousand dollars in <laughs> revenue <laughs> and, and it's a very, very different thing, isn't it, Robin? <laughs> it is. And, you know, and even if you've had really good success, let's say you got to a hundred thousand and you made 60. There's a temptation to say, okay, well, I'm going to try to get to 300000 in gross revenue. When you make that goal the top line revenue, you will start to make sacrifices on the bottom line. You'll hire more people. You'll get a bigger space. You'll get more overhead. And you'll forget that 300000 is not going – even though that's a 3x from 100, you're not going to 3x your earnings because you have so much more overhead. And right. so your overall net margin is going to shrink. So you, you want to make sure you're being intentional, right? And so you're thinking – Okay, if I want to get instead of saying like I want to get to three hundred thousand in revenue, um, you didn't start your business so you could brag on Facebook to people that you didn't know at the time about how much gross revenue you're making. <laughs> that wasn't why, right? It was because what? you wanted to be at your daughter's dance recital, or you wanted to go on vacations, or you know you wanted to sail around the world. So it's important that you build a business that will actually support the end goal that you wanted. So if you wanted to sail around the world, a print-on-demand business where you have to be chained to your basement printing things every day, probably not going to get you what you want. Sure. So you need to be thinking about, is the business that you're building now going to be a prison cell for you in the future? Mm. And is the prison is the, the business that you're building now, if I scale that up, is that really going to get me what we want? I had a client that came to me, a multiple seven-figure seller, and he's like, I need to get you know this amount in gross in, in profit down to me. And I said, great. And I said, he's like, so I just need to grow. And so we did the numbers and to grow, he would have had to get past like 10 million a year. Um, and oh, I wow. said, you know, he's like, I can't do that. I mean, I barely see my kids now. There's just no way that I can <laughs> do that. And, you know, what we determined is if he increased his margin a little bit by making some changes here, it would be difficult. If he, you know, he lowered his uh, expenses a little bit here, maybe he did a little bit less of this, a little more of that. Uh, then by doing that, he would be able to get to his overall goal What by by not having to increase his revenue total very much. Um, it was really about kind of shifting the way that his revenue was working. So, and, and as not, that's never going to be an easy path. It's going to mean a lot of change. And especially when you have a stable business, that change can be difficult because it feels like it's kind of like playing on the monkey bars. You have to swing and let go in order to get to the next one. And it, it, it is going to always feel like the world is falling apart as you're doing that. So just be prepared and make sure you have the right support for that. I'm sure people are, uh, are, are at ease or, or it's calming for them to hear that uh, it's normal to feel like the world is falling apart sometimes. So I'm sure they, <laughs> they get solace in that. So you mentioned a couple of differences as far as, um, you know, if you're going to be a, a drop shipper or hire a drop shipper, if you're going to have your own production, one of the examples you mentioned was, you know, having to stock all those sizes and colors and variations and whatnot, if you're going to do it all in house, what other differences uh, that come to your mind should people keep in mind when they are trying to decide whether they want to have people drop ship for them or do all the production in house? So with drop ship, you have to worry about things like, you know, turnaround time, you know, how, you know, what are your customers, what experience are your customers going to get quality control? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it, you're going to have to worry about, you know, is that person doing the job to the level that I want my customers to experience? Right. right. And that's going to be a lot of where the hiccups mm -hmm. are, it's, you know, communication, API feeds, uh, web hooks. You know, it's going to be a lot of a lot of things along those on that nature. If you're buying the inventory, then you're going to need to think about, um, you know, ma really managing for like we talked about sell through. But yeah. also, should you buy, you know, 10,000 of those Glidden shirts or should you buy, <laughs> you know, a thousand at a time? Uh, Cindy Thomason, who is a uh, rope e uh, profit first for e-commerce. She and I mm -hmm. um, recently did an a interview article for um, Sellerly, um, and in it, you know, she talks about how there's a big temptation to go to buy the biggest amount possible um, mm -hmm. because you get like five cents cheaper per, right. per shirt or ten, you know, dollar cheaper per shirt. Sure. However, if that ties up so much of your working capital that you can't breathe for six months, or you end up taking on debt at, you know, at 20% APR, you're not saving any money, right? So, you know, if, if, especially if you're on physical inventory, one of the areas that people get 
strung out the most in is they end up borrowing money uh, and they forget that Mm. the the cost of that interest is going to be eating into your profit and loss, even though it doesn't show on your profit and loss because that shows on your balance sheet. So you really need to be thinking about the cost, um, you know, and we, when Cindy and I did a lot of stuff together, we also talked about like the economics of one unit. So kind of looking and saying for my whole operation, my whole, all of my expenses per month are a thousand dollars and I sell a thousand t-shirts. That means that to pay the guy that packs up the stuff and to, you know, buy the ink that goes on the printer is a dollar per unit for each of my shirts. Mm-hmm. And then starting to use that as kind of like a, a, a lazy kind of calculation when you're kind of daydreaming in the middle of the night about what you should be doing in the next month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I know well that um, keeping me up at night daydream about you know and doing <laughs> math in my head and if this happens and then this happens minus this and then I can make millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just- that. That's the entrepreneur in me, I think. I think we all kind of have those those thoughts and have a hard time sleeping in the middle of the night. Um, what You mentioned uh, profit and loss statement. You miss, mentioned balance sheet. For some of our listeners who, again, you know, are just kind of getting started with this whole thing, can you share a little bit about the difference between a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet? Um, it's a little off script, but I think it's important to, um, for some of our listeners. Yeah, it's very important. So... Um, if you don't, so when I first started my business, I thought accounting was math. Let me tell you, accounting mm. is not math. It's voodoo created by the devil. <laughs> it, it is horrible. It doesn't make any sense. Like this lady accountant came over and she's like, well, you don't, I showed her my little spreadsheet. She's like, well, you don't have dual entry. And I was like, I don't know what you mean by dual entry. I had to put my hands under my bottom because I was afraid I was going to punch her. Now, Travis knows that I'm not a very violent person, but I really like Nate put his shoulder. And after that, my husband put my hand, his, his hands heavy on my shoulders because he was afraid I was going to hit her too. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't understand this piece yet, this is a, a really important part about being a business owner for a couple of reasons. One, you're going to need this to fill out your taxes important mm. if you decide to like buy a house or sell a house they're going to ask for this documentation if you sell your business you're going to need this if you get a loan from like sba you're going to need this so it is important i recommend you not use something like GoDaddy accounting because it doesn't have the full suite right so um, there's a book called fresh from the lemonade stand uh, that you can buy on amazon and it basically goes through how these documents work in a way that I could understand them and it really broke it down. So fresh from the lemonade stand, like an introduction to accounting or something along those lines. Hmm. Um, so there's your profit and loss and your profit and loss says this is, so you basically, uh, you, you, there's like a chunk at the top, like a, think about a box at the top and that has all the money that's coming into your business. And then there's like a middle chunk that says, okay, these are your cost of goods. So like if you were buying your shirts, that's where the cost of your physical shirts would go. And then there's a bottom where it's your expenses and that's that 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 piece is where your your cable bill and your uh not your not your home cable bill but like your internet <laughs> for your office uh your 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 lease for your place or you know um the 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 um the software that runs your pod stuff that's where all that's going to go and at the bottom there are a couple other things and that, you know those can be a little bit more complicated depending you know but basically it tells you like this is how much money you had and when i first started i thought that you know the cash like if i had a hundred dollars left in my bank account then it should say a hundred dollars at the bottom but that number at the bottom is actually not tied to your bank account at all. So right. it's just saying this is how much you have. And then there's a separate a separate sheet, a separate piece of paper called your balance sheet. And this is how much money is owed to you and how much money do you owe, the, owe other people. Right. And so if, let's say if you are not taking a salary and you're just taking money out of your account, what's called a draw, then your that won't show on your profit and loss. And so it can make your business look more profitable than it really is. And that could be a reason why you don't have cash flow, even though your profit and loss says you should. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you have a $30,000 loan and you're paying, you know, 
uh, let's say you're paying a thousand dollars a month and you can't figure out why it says that you're profitable but you are losing money every month it's because you're not getting that whole picture uh, and that's when I would recommend that you get a bookkeeper that really will do some like profit coaching yeah. um, not to mention her again Cindy Thomason does do that and there's lots of other people that will do that too so um, but you want to have somebody that's going to have some experience with e-commerce uh, they don't have to know Amazon but if you're doing PayPal, you need to make sure that they understand PayPal because PayPal is a little tricky. Um, yeah. The biggest thing is that if you're doing inventory, if you're holding inventory, that they've worked with inventory-based businesses because there's certain deductions and things that, that need to be set up a certain way in order for you mm -hmm. to take advantage of them. Uh, and your bookkeeper doesn't have to be the same as your accountant. They can be two different people. They are for me. I have a bookkeeper uh, that helps me manage all of that uh, day to day. And then I actually switch accountants about every three years because I like to have somebody with a fresh point of view. Um, hmm. Because, you know, you, it, it's easy to have a client and kind of be like, oh, you know, they're, they're kind of my client already, but to not really go in with the deep dive that you might with a new client. So we start sure. interviewing about every three years on that. Huh. And for those uh, listening, the book that she referenced uh, on Amazon is The Accounting Game, Basic Accounting Fresh from the Lemonade Stand uh, that you can get on Amazon. So uh, I actually might get that myself because my wife and I have been having <laughs> conversations of like what the hell is any of this actually mean? So it's a good pro tip. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be grabbing that book here soon. Um, so when we talk about business analytics, Robin, you said – when I asked you about setting up a POD business, psychoanalytics, I believe, is what is a term that you used. Um, what kind of business ad analytics and what other kinds uh, of things are important um, when, when building your business and just kind of trying to get all the data necessary to figure out where you are and where you need to go? Well, let's start with some business analytics and then we can kind of go to the psycho stuff. Um, <laughs> oh, you always want to keep the psycho stuff later in your life. Yes. Um, <laughs> but with the business analytics, you know, it does come down to having either a good profit and loss or some other. So if you don't have a good manage of your the way the money is flowing through your business, mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult to scale profitably because you're not going to be able to know what levers are like if i pull this lever how did it actually show up so mm -hmm. um like for example on amazon um let's say that you have somebody who's just kind of dumping your bank transactions and doesn't really understand amazon the way that amazon transactions work for most sellers that are have like the every two week disbursement is it looks like the, you know one month out of every year it's going to look like you made a bazillion dollars because three payouts <laughs> end up in that one month you didn't really make a bazillion dollars. So you could spend the next four months chasing your tail trying to figure out what you did that month that made your sales so what good. Sure. And then you're going to have a couple months where maybe because of the, you know, because of the way that the date line, maybe you only got one and a half or something along those lines. And so um, you need to make sure, you know, um, using something to make sure your transactions are really lining up uh, and making sure your expenses are really lining up. So... You, um, this also means really understanding as you're advertising, if, you know, most people with POD are having to do some sort of ads. Sure. You really need to understand the cost of your ads. And, um, and this includes understanding what your average learning time and what your average co uh, ROAS is during the learning phase and what your average ROAS is specifically once that learning phase is completed for that platform. Um, you know, you need to kind of have that built in, you know, that we're going to spend $6,000 on ads for this particular product line. Um, we know that the first thousand that we spend, we're gathering data, you know, we're getting in fake Facebook's algorithm to get us out of learning, the learning mode. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we have that adjusted. Uh, and accounted for. Um, and it's also really important that you're kind of monitoring your labor. Um, you, monitoring your labor is going to be most important if you're doing POD. Um, monitoring your inventory is also going to be important if you're doing um, physical products. Um, and th so, th you know, I think understanding those pieces and then understanding, like, tracking, like, how many do you sell, uh, which are actually selling the best, um, which took off the fastest, and trying to build Halo out product lines based off of that. Um, psychoanal mm -hmm. uh, psychoanalytics is, um, basically, you, you've heard of demographics, right? Mm -hmm. So demographics, psychoanalytics, takes it a little bit further. So instead of just saying somebody is makes $70,000 a year, they live in Texas and they have a college degree, we say that this person, uh, you know, is a Trump, is a 
is a evangelical Trump supporter who, you know, who doesn't work out or in drive Chevy trucks. And so like, it helps you identify what are the internal motivations. So, you know, like for example, if you did a shirt with a big Chevy truck on it, right. And then you had Nancy Pelosi standing next to it, that shirt probably is not going to sell well. (laughs) Right. You know, if you have, um, if you try to sell shirts in Wisconsin to people with the big Dallas cowboy blue and white star, probably not going to sell well. <laughs> you know, it, like there's certain things, and I don't know about, about much about sports, so these are probably not great analogies for me to give. But like for Disney people, <laughs> like you can be trying to do, to, to draw do a shirt for Disney lovers, and you might not realize that well that that particular character is only in a franchise that's related to Disney or Walt Disney world. And so only people who know about Disney world are going to appreciate that. And so you've eliminated a massive amount of your audience by adding this other character onto your shirt. Hmm. Yeah. I can see how that, I can see how that would be very useful. Um, there's just kind of knowing, I think, I think Travis, you and I've talked about this before when, you know, opening a business, you kind of, I think when even starting this podcast, we had this conversation um, of like, okay, who is the ideal customer? Who's the person that we think is going to walk in or find this podcast and press download, press play? So when building a, a business, it's kind of you know having that same idea when you're creating designs. Who is it that we're going after here? Who's the ideal customer mm-hmm. uh, that, would, that we think would, would click buy on this particular design? Yeah, I would say though also I think that I think that that's definitely, and we even talked about this a couple of weeks ago on um, our mailbag question when they were talking, when someone who did private label was asking about what, you know, how should I do niche research? And one of the things that, um, it, one of the things I think you can get away with, I don't know if that's the best choice of words in print <laughs> on demand is going really, really wide. Um, and not worrying so much about the niches and just trying to cover all of them, um, you know, going so far wide that you just have, you're kind of on every street corner, um, and you're not as worried about your specific demographic is, I, I, you know, forgive my ignorance, Robin, but I wonder, is there a, a philosophy of business that, that, that embraces that methodology or is that just kind of, or is that kind of, um, nuanced towards the particular type of business we're doing in print on demand. So there's a reason why Glidden shirts doesn't just put a random, like, like an infinite amount of design. They could put all those designs on themselves, but they don't for several reasons. It, there's nothing wrong with going really, really wide, but you, mm-hmm. you're not going to be as efficient, right? Because um, you're going to be making a lot of designs that don't sell. So the wider you go and the less data you're managing, the more designs you need. Now, at a certain point, especially when you're learning and trying to identify, I think that that can be really valuable uh, mm-hmm. to, you know, to get, you know, to have enough corner to identify what's right but especially as you mature it would be important to uh, be able to have a little bit more of a psychographic on some of your main products Um, even just to identify what platforms you want to expand to right Mm. so if your audience is 60 plus expanding into uh, instagrams being able to purchase you know with a swipe up probably not going to get you great results Um, you know so it, it would even help you identify where you're going to push some of these things. So, you know, if you have an older audience, um, you know, that, that you, maybe you're not going to focus as much on social media, but maybe you do focus on Bing shopping because you know that a lot of people are going to end up on Bing because they don't know how to install another browser. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you focus on that. Um, so there are a lot of things that you, that would af- not only affect the kind of like where you advertise um, and how you advertise. And if you can get delve into a couple of niches uh, and understand them really well, then you can make shirts that sell um, a lot. At, uh, uh, so you, you want to be wide enough where you're able to get a lot of buyers on that one shirt, of course. Uh, but you want to make sure you understand the niche so you're creating shirts that really motivate people to share, social share. Because if you hmm. can get people to, you know, like I bought Perry, uh, our friend Perry a shirt and it said Star Trek, but it was in the Star Wars fonts. Like you have to be <laughs> into like the nerd world to know like why yeah. is that funny? Like, you know, a right. non-nerd doesn't understand why that's funny, right? Uh, hmm. So in order to get like this shirt and he was like, this is the best shirt. And he shared it on social, you know, that he bought this shirt. And I, I bought it from, you know, one of the, 
the the websites that are out there. Um, mm-hmm. So it, there are some benefits. Like if you look at some of the the things that like if you look at like busted teas and snorg teas mm-hmm. and things along those lines, mm-hmm. a lot of them have delved pretty deep into specific niches. And I can mm-hmm. get shirts that like I got a shirt that has like a bunny on top of a bunch of skulls and it says run away. And like I get a lot of weird looks when I wear that. People are like, what the heck is that? And then somebody will be like, ah, run away! Because they know that it's a Monty Python reference. But there's right. only so many of us, right? So, you know, I think that there can be advantages uh, to to exploiting a niche. Um, yeah. Of course, you have to be careful that you're not exploiting a niche to the point where you're getting involved in anything. It could be copyright infringement. I mean, a couple of sure. Disney shirt places got took, taken down last year because they got a yeah. little too close. Um, <laughs> right. You know, so <laughs> you do have yeah. to be careful, of course, uh, in the intellectual property piece. And if you're new and you don't understand intellectual property, I would say, like, you should really, like, at least understand the basics of it so you have right. an, an idea of right. how to not get in trouble. Yeah, we yeah. had Ken Reel on a few episodes back and kind of delved into the that. And it was really good um, learning some of that uh, – some of that from from somebody yeah. who's really really understands trademark and copyright and all of that. That was a really interesting episode. If if our listeners haven't heard that episode, I believe it's episode five. Just uh, uh, or no, I'm sorry, I think it's episode eight uh, with Ken Reel. So are you looking? You firing up yes, the Google machine right I now? I am. I am. No, I figured the, the Google. Uh, it is <laughs> <laughs> episode nine. Episode nine. Ooh. Licensing and copyright. You weren't even Kenra. close. This I know is, I wasn't. This even is close. why this is why he <laughs> needs me. This is why I'm here. I'm his it's Google machine slash independent fact checker. It's, <laughs> it it it's true. It's totally true. Um oh, I got one more question on this and then we'll 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 transition. But I I'm just wondering if there are or if you could identify Robin, um, you know, data is kind of this buzzword, you know, in, in, in certain situations, obviously it's very important, but I'm wondering if there are certain data points that can lead to, um, distracting us from what's really important, you know, getting so focused on one piece of data that, you know, we just kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, or maybe that's a bad analogy, but you get, you get what I'm saying? Like it just, it distracts from the, you know, the real bottom line data that we really need to, to focus on. Is, is there anything that, that you could, maybe uh, using as an, as an example of stuff that maybe isn't as, as needed as some of the, the more, I don't know, profit and loss balance sheet types of data that we uh, need to run our businesses off of. So, you know, all data can be kind of like a Jedi, you know, it can go to the dark side. It can go to the light side. You know, there's a lot of, uh, so, I mean, like even ROAS, you know, return on ad spend, um, you know, people will be like, oh, I'm getting a four ROAS, I'm getting a four ROAS. Well, if your margin on that was 10% before you started your ads, four ROAS, you're going to go bankrupt really fast. So good for you. You know, like you have to be careful <laughs> that you're not like shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, this is the same thing for, you know, it, and, and the it garbage in, garbage out. If you're just... If you have some guy in the Philippines doing your books and you're making business decisions off that and you're not checking his work, uh, you could be making some bad decisions because that data is not going to be really valuable. The things that I, you know, I really look at on the overall business is I want to look at profitability. I want to look at scalability. Um, and, and, and that really comes down to systems uh, and being able to monitor, mm. like, you know, how many designs are – or is it feasible? You know, can we increase, you know, our shirts, the number of shirts that we put out, you know, 5% by, you know, having them use this process instead of that process or by, oh my you gosh. know, yeah. So, cause you I can just, change. You know, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I feel like we've done our audience a huge disservice because we really haven't talked about SOPs, standard operating procedures. And that was one of the biggest takeaways. Um, yeah. And maybe we'll have you on later to talk about SOPs, but that, those were some of the biggest um, helps in my business and really uh, drilling down into standard operating procedures. Um, but what I'm hearing you say, is, as far as distractions, you're, you're really saying that any part, any part of the data can be a distraction because the data is only there to serve the bigger picture in the first point. And if you're not looking at it as, as the, the big picture, any part of the data can be a distraction. 
Yeah, you know, like when I look at my data, there's certain data points that I look at on a like on a regular basis, like you know maybe daily or weekly. Um, but then, then there's bigger pieces of data that I'm going to look at on an overarching, you know, maybe like a monthly or quarterly basis. Mm-hmm. So you know, you want to look at your ad performance probably two to three times a week. Uh, you know, for first ramping up or you're brand new, you want to look at it more often, but not change stuff so often that it it, it can it can mess up the learning algorithms a little bit. So you want to make sure you give things time. Time and make sure you understand how those reporting things work, like especially on Amazon. Uh, but you know, you want to look at profitability and then things like conversion rate, things like ROAS. You know, I know that people make fun of Amazon because we use ACOS instead of ROAS. Um, not to get nerdy again, but I kind of talk like ACOS is kind of like the Ewoks of the Amazon space. Depending on when you got in, you think it's the best thing ever or the worst. Um, like because so ACOS. But it includes like the cost of the sale. So it's a little bit easier to identify profitability. So don't get too caught up in ROAS. Start looking at kind of if you can sh- switch it into a cost is a really easy uh, equation. You're basically just flipping it upside down. Um, then that can be valuable even if you're using Facebook or, you know, Google ads, um, other ad mediums. So, you know, I think looking at which of your shirts are getting the best conversion rate, which of your ads, uh, which of your shirts are doing the best on ads. And then if you are building an audience and you find a shirt that does really, really well making fun of something, then you can now expand out and create more shirts like that. And you know that you have – if you can segment your list on kind of what niche they bought in, then you can – show them more shirts, which is why I think Busted Tea and Snorg and stuff, they do so mm-hmm. many of those, Those they go have gone down so far down that nerd um, yeah. rabbit hole is because it, they can keep selling shirts to me over and over again um, because right, I'm just right. a nerd and I will keep buying nerd shirts until I die. <laughs> <laughs> Customer for life, literally. Yeah. Um, so, Robin, we of course are in the beginning of 2021. 2020 is in the review mirror now and so is there anything that we need to be focusing on or business owners need to be focused on focusing on to close out uh 2020 as we go into 2021 so if you're running google ads you need to go back and really check your stuff because the changes that they made in like hiding in like the hidden queries and some of the things Mm -hmm. if you're looking for somebody to follow in that area nava hopkins n-a-v-a-a N-A-V-A-H, uh, Hopkins. She is awesome on ads. She writes for Search Engine Journal, uh, and she posts a lot of really good stuff. You know, Twitter, I find, like, PPC chat, following PPC chat on Twitter is a good hashtag. And then there's also uh, marketing Twitter is that new hashtag that I follow on Twitter. Um, mm. you know, so you need to really be looking at some of those changes. Mm. Um I would say the first thing you need to do is you need to look at the overall health of your business and identify two weak points, two sieve points where money is leaking out of your business um, or that you're not making as much money and focus on that. And then, then also take a look at your current marketplaces, websites, ad strategy and say, okay, looking forward, this is where I see people are going to struggle. So I was kind of relying on PBN and private, you know, private blog networks to kind of rank organically for certain things. Mm-hmm. Now it's not as effective. These, you know, in order to be to rank well, I really need to learn more about eat things on Google. So, you know, depending on where you're selling, you need to look at kind of where the changes are and just stay a little bit ahead. There were so many changes last year and there's been such an influx of online shoppers. That it's really, it's, it's, it's a high tide. So you just need to be careful to remember that this is a high mm. tide and the tide mm. will ease back a little bit. It's not going to go yeah. away, but, you know, real stores will open and then people will go to Ross again to buy shirts. So um, mm-hmm. you do need to be thinking about that and making sure when the Blasphemy. high tide comes out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My sister's going through like Ross withdrawal. She's like, "Can we? Can we? Do you think we can go for just a couple hours or for just an hour?" I'm like, no, no, you can't go at all. No, Ross, TJ Max. That's hilarious. Yeah, you just need to be looking. I think the biggest thing is, and not to get so caught up in what who's he, what's it is doing, like the fancy guy with the big car that you see in your Facebook groups, like don't worry about what he's doing. Worry yeah. about how do you keep your business profitable? Cause here's a hint. His business might not actually even be profitable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a huge, huge distraction for all of us, I think. And it's, mm-hmm. if you can win that game right there and, and, and not, 
play that comparison game, um, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're winning at that point because it's so easy. Like you said, just to see that, that guy's quote, you know, success when he posts his, his revenue numbers and says that he made, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in Q4 and you're yeah. like, Oh man, I suck. I'm no good. I'm never going to get good at this. And, and cause yeah. you're seeing all of your issues, but you're not seeing any of their issues. And I, I think that's right. a huge huge point that, that you bring up there, Robin. So, so planning for 2021, I know you're huge, um, on planning and, and, you know, we could talk about SOPs here. Um, there's a lot of other things there's, you know, specifically strategic planning. We're going to be doing probably, um, several hours at our business with our whole staff, um, on strategic planning, specifically going through different parts of our, our business, identifying pain points and a lot of those things. It, are there things that you could kind of, you know, in a podcast form, share with our listeners that would help them, uh, plan for 2021? I mean, you already said, you know, pick two things that you want to kind of fix, but what, what, what can you do with those two things? What are some ideas that, um, you know, that our listeners might want to implement in 2021? So I like to set goals and I'm going to move from Y to X by when. So I'm going to move from, uh, you know, from Y, you know, from, you know, $10,000 a month to $70,000 a month by um, December. And then I, then I also add like little caveats, which I, I can't remember which book I got that from. I stole it from somebody. I'm not a genius like that. That's, you know, it, nothing's new under the sun. I had a couple caveats. So like I said, I want to move my monthly revenue from this to this by December. And then I said, without increasing my expenses or taking on any new debt and, um, I had a, and so I, I also added a profitability goal that I wanted to be, pro, you know, like I wanted to have this many thousands of dollars above the, you know, if it is as positive at the bottom of my profit and loss. Um, and so then what I do is I say, okay, so I'm imagining it's December, uh, it's December 31st. We're getting my New Year's hats on and getting ready to head into 2022. And I think back and I'm interviewing myself and I say, self, you did awesome this year. Tell me, self. How did you do it? And I say by no, by November thirty first, I would have uh, I would have brought on X more clients, you know, or I would have grown my email list to this amount. By you know November, I would have had this many designs, and I would have had my email at this many. Um, so you want to make sure you're really identifying what those levers are. And I kind of imagine it all the way back. I got this from a class that uh, you know I took twenty years ago, and. Um, you know, they called it like the Merlin effect or something. And basically you say, if you, you know, and then what, what happens when you get all the way back, if you get all the way back and you say, that's way too much work, there's no way in, in God's green earth that I'm going to do that. Then you say, okay, well, let me readjust that. And maybe I need to lengthen out the time or lower the goal. And then sometimes you're like, wow, I could actually do that, that goal sooner. But by making sure that you know what needs to be done this week, next week, next month, it keeps you on target. So because if I say I want to lose 40 pounds, it's really easy for me to say I'm going to still have that cheesecake tonight because I can walk it off later. You know, But if you say I want to lose a pound and a half this week, then I'm really counting my calories and being a lot more careful. So you want to kind of take those same things. A couple of really good books, Clockwork by Mike Michalowicz, Pumpkin Plan if you use a lot of clients by Mike Michalowicz, uh, mm -hmm. Rocket Fuel if you're over a million po uh, a, a million uh, plus, and then um, Four Disciplines of Execution if you have a large team. Those are all really good goal-setting books. Uh, getting Things Done um, by mm -hmm. David Allen is, is a good one for beginners. If you, you know, you don't want to get too, if you're still a solopreneur, that's a really good one to get started with. Hmm. Wow. That's, um, that's awesome, Robin. This is a, a lot of, a lot of really good information. Um, I think, I think what I'm hearing kind of the overview of this is, is, um, there, there really are a lot of different, different parts of your business that it's important to, to keep keep track of. And yeah. so, um, I know we, we, we've gone on for a while. I, I'm wondering if there are, um, you know, one or two tips or I know you've given us a whole podcast full of tips, yes. but I mean like something that <laughs> more specifically to somebody who we, we've had a couple of listeners that have written in and, you know, said, Hey, I'm just beginning. I just bought a printer 
and a press and I'm going to start pressing mugs in my basement. What, you know, what kind of printer should I get? What kind of mug, you know, press should I get? Blah, 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 blah. They're asking very, very beginner questions. And I'm wondering if there are, um, you know, maybe a couple of pieces of advice you would have for them as they're brand new starting out um, and like setting up their business. Is there anything that you would share with them? So for beginners, I would say you need, I want you to write this on a big post-it note and just put it on your thing and on your computer. And it's just going to say fastest path to cash. You need to get some wins before your spouse says you need to stop this stupid hobby because you're not making any money. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that goes both ways, <laughs> whether yeah. you're the female or the male spouse. So yep. you need to get learn how – and once you get those first couple of sales, it will become real for you and you will take it more seriously. You will approach it differently. So I want you to not focus about on you know what's the exact right printer, but what can get me cash in my pocket as quick as possible and let me focus on that. Once I've identified how I can start to make some money, then you're going to continue doing what's making you money. And then you can have one shiny object. This is one. This doesn't mean six courses. This doesn't mean you're going to buy seven sublimation printers of seven different types, and you're going to do all these different things. You're gonna you're gonna start with like I'm going to be like one step above the people in the cricket groups that are putting things on mugs. Like so, one step above that, right? And I'm going to make some stuff. And I'm going to sell some stuff, and then I'm going to use a little bit of that profit to buy the next printer. And I'm going to keep making the mugs because I, now that's profitable, but now I'm going to start making the T-shirts. And you can't go too wide. It would be like if I said I'm going to learn to play music, and I'm going to learn to play the piano, the drums, and the harp all at the same time. <laughs> you're going to be learning so many different things. You're not going to get any traction. You're going to lose the, the, the motivation you need. So I would say pick one thing, commit to it for three months. And then as you have success, you can you can always halo out. But if you halo out, if you get too wide, it's very difficult. You're kind of like Fred Flintstone. You're, just, you're rubbing your feet, but you're not doing any, getting anywhere. And right. that makes it very hard to make the money to be able to go full time. Um, for those of you who are past the beginner stage, the biggest area where I see people get caught up on is they're so focused on growing and they get so caught up in like all the fires that need to ha be put out all the time that they don't actually get anything done. Hmm. So you need to triage and you need to say, I'm going to drop balls for the next month. And these are the balls that I'm going to let fall. So maybe I'm not going to do, I'm, I'm not going to focus on this particular marketplace for this month, or maybe I'm just going to let, uh, you know, some of the things that are kind of broken run for a little bit, um, yeah. because I'm going to really focus on building some SOPs so that we can, um, in some processes, building out like an Asana board or a Trello board, so that I'm not running from fire to fire. You, as you can, you can brute force your way to about two million for many people um, in most e-commerce platforms. But after that, it gets very difficult to just work your way through. You have to have some systems, some planning, and some strategy. Uh, and you know, different people hit that that cap. Um, some people hit it at fifty thousand dollars a month. Some people hit it at a much higher. So it really kind of depends on you know the niche, niche you're in, kind of how you're working, and what your cost of goods are. But those are kind of some of the big things I would say. Wow, that's awesome! Like Travis said, this this podcast has been just full of of tips and insight that I think uh, are even helpful for Travis and I. We always say that when we interview yeah. people, um, we're always the first listener. And so we're always the ones that learn the first um, and, and get to then pass it on to to those in, in the listening audience. So, Robin, before we wrap this up, if someone wants to reach out to you, someone wants to find you to ask your advice to hire your agency, uh, to get your help on their business, where do they find you? What platforms, websites, so on and so forth. So go ahead and plug all of that and let people know where they can find you and follow you. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at AMZ Robin Johnson, Robin Johnson, or uh, AMZ Robin Johnson, that's R-O-B-Y-N Johnson, or you can go to marketplaceblueprint.com. If you want to learn about listing optimization, if you go to marketplace marketplaceblueprint.com forward slash Facebook, it'll take you to a Facebook group that we have specifically for listing optimization. Mm. Um, and so you can also get a hold of me. You can find me there. You can, you know, please don't stalk me, though. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I just want to say one more thing that um, being a business owner means failing 
more times than you're successful. The people mm. that you're looking up to, you just haven't seen the times that they've drifted in the mud. So you, you want to be able to – don't avoid failure. Just yeah. fail fast, get up. Fail fast, get up. And you know, make sure you're man- managing your costs so that you can afford to keep getting back up. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And yeah, it, 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 this is – it's tough. And yeah. anybody who tells you that being a business owner is easy is not being truthful. <laughs> it's tough. 100%. Um, but it is yeah. well worth it, you know? Yeah, it's like the uh, – Winston Churchill has a quote that says, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I think that's yep. very a- applicable when you're running your own business. Is like you said, it's it's going to happen, and you don't see mm-hmm. uh, you don't see the the failures when you're looking at someone's well curated moments of perfection on their Instagram or, or Twitter or Facebook <laughs> and what have you, and their new cars and all that. So uh, yeah, that's that, that's awesome. Uh, Travis, anything else? Uh, go ahead, uh, Robin. Uh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I was in an Amazon conference. I might have even been RMC, and we were talking about how many. Why are there so many stinking youth ministers that are successful <laughs> in uh, in in Amazon? And I think it's because as a youth minister, you just you 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 keep failing because the mission is so much more important that you're willing yeah. to keep trying. And I think that that's a good. You know, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, you really need to understand why you're doing it and keep that why at yeah. the forefront because otherwise mm-hmm. it's too easy to give up. So, yeah. uh, and I did like, I failed 400. We were, we were in a network marketing company. My husband tried doing real estate. Like we did, we, 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 we can't judge your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 13. Sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think just sidebar before I kick it to Travis to, to any final thoughts? I think the only time that I've hung out with you, Robin, was with Travis at RMR scene. We're waiting, yeah, for, pi- at the bar. We're waiting for pizza to be delivered to the lobby at like two thirty in the morning. I think <laughs> there, was, there was a group of us just starving because everything else was closed. So that was uh, RMRC was, was always fun. Not at my best at that moment, <laughs> but <laughs> Travis, anything else before we uh, uh, wrap things up? No, I just. Um super super happy to have you on the podcast robin um always been a big fan and i I really appreciate your um you know just your your heart to want to help people and and um really encourage them no matter what point of the journey they're on you've always been um you know a phone call or a Facebook message away for me for for many years and I've 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 taken advantage of that and I've learned a lot from you and I really appreciate you um and call and, and very proud to be able to call you a friend and thanks for coming on our show Robin <laughs> Thanks. And if you're listening to this, you need to keep listening to this. Um, you, these guys are really generous, and it takes a lot to put a podcast out week after week. And so, make sure you thank them for you know doing this for you guys as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Robin, for joining us, and we look forward to having you back because I'm sure there's more that we can touch on uh, with you as well. So, thank you, thank you so much again for taking time out of your schedule to to join us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our interview with Robin Johnson. We told you on the front end of this thing that there was going to be so much knowledge shared with us. Travis, what is what, what was one of your biggest takeaways, man, of, of this interview? We covered so much ground, and I feel like we could have her back to cover, like you were saying, even in the interview, uh, SOPs and, and stuff like that, which is something we probably should cover um, for the listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, but, man, what, what did you think of the interview, and what was uh, what was your takeaway? I always love listening to Robin talk because yeah. she's got so much information, so much knowledge, and she's really she's really good at what she does. I, I love the fact that she, you know, tried to kind of boil it all down to, um, you know, not the, the whole competitive thing. We talked a little bit about yes. that. We've we've yeah. touched on that in the past on different episodes, and just not not falling into that trap because I mean, I, there are people that listen to this podcast and are like, Oh man, I, I want to be like Travis and Josiah and what they're doing with their print on demand is so cool and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'll tell you, just like Robin said, you know, I have fallen on my face multiple times (laughs) as, as have you. And, and the only difference between me and somebody who, you know, um, is just starting is that I've fallen down more, <laughs> right? you know, I've just yeah. cho- chose to, to get back up. And I, I think right. that's such an important thing. I mean, and, and then the other thing, the other side of that is that, um, 
it never goes away in your business. Mm-hmm. There's the, mm-hmm. always this temptation to to look at somebody else's business and be envious yeah. and be envious of that and yeah. envious of their success. And you know, you've you've heard the idea that uh, you've heard of the overnight success and that there is yeah. no such thing as an overnight success because, like she said at the end of the interview, you're comparing your chapter one with their chapter thirteen, and it right. just doesn't work that way. No, absolutely not. I love that she touched on that too. Um, you know, there's a, there's a saying that says, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And, uh, it's Mm. true when you, when you compare yourself where you're at with someone else, you're going to not only rob yourself of, of the joy that you should be experiencing from just taking the initiative to start, uh, but also robbing yourself from being present in the moment, um, and enjoying where you're at and enjoying the start of the journey. Like Travis said, you know, he and I, you know, switching, basically switched business models, you know, respectively in our businesses from Amazon to print on demand. And, and we could regale Multiple you with, times. yes, we could regale you with story <laughs> after story of uh, when we were doing Amazon wholesale accounts that just went south uh, with mm. various products or, or retail arbitrage buys that completely bit us in the ass. Like there's tons yeah. of those stories, tons of those, like, well, we're going right. to chalk it up as a loss. And so last Travis was saying, you know, we have fallen more often, which is the biggest difference between us and someone that's just starting out. So the one of the biggest reasons in starting this podcast was we want to be able to turn around and kind of guide you through the path that, that mm-hmm. we went and starting and kind of let you know where that pothole was that we, you know, bruised our knee or cut up our shin or whatever. So we just want to kind of help you guys along in the journey. But uh, yeah, comparison and, and, and trying to um, be on, on par with the person you see on Instagram or the people you hear in the podcasts. Um, while it's good to have goals, it's not good to let those goals become comparison and then just kind of rob you from, from the experiences that you should be having. So I was really thankful she yeah. touched on that because not a lot of people uh, talk about that because a lot of people who talk about sales and 1Xing or 2Xing, 3Xing and kind of tend to kind of paint it with a broad brush of glitz and glamour, but it's not always <laughs> that way to get to that point. It's not. It really isn't. You're right. It's not not pretty all the time. You no, you, know, no. you, you do skin your knees mm-hmm. um, because you do fall down. I mean, yeah, like you said, I could tell stories upon stories of, <laughs> of you know, from private label to wholesale to retail arbitrage to yeah. you know, drop shipping, print on demand to doing in my basement to burning mugs over yeah. and over. I have cases. Well, I had cases and cases of burnt mugs that I just went through trying to figure all this out. And, you know, it's just, it's all part of my story. Yeah. And, um, yep. you know, I did make some, some mistakes, but I also had some pretty awesome wins and I wouldn't be where I'm at today without both. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Yeah. It takes, it takes failure to have success. Can't have one without the other. Uh, so thank you guys so much for listening. If you have questions for Travis and I, if you have questions for Robin that you'd like us to pass along, maybe we, when we have her back, um, we can kind of hold those questions, but as always print on demandcast.com is where you go to find the show info at print on demandcast.com is how you reach out to Travis and I ask us questions or anything that you have on your mind in regards to print on demand. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google, all of the places you get your favorite podcasts, your favorite print on demand podcast is there as well. So <laughs> be sure to write on iTunes and subscribe. Uh, but until next time, guys, for Travis, I'm Josiah. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Print on Demand cast. See ya. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Print on Demand cast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you've got a question or a suggestion for the show, send Travis and Josiah an email at info at printondemandcast.com. Take a minute to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And don't forget to subscribe now so you don't miss next week's episode. See you next week.